Welcome to Coming from Left Field, where we have conversations about politics, books, and current events with your host, Greg Gottles and Pat Cummings. In previous podcasts, we explored the hidden history of the socialist and communist influences on our labor unions that proved instrumental in securing many gains for workers still enjoyed today, such as the 40-hour work week, overtime pay, medical and retirement benefits. Also inspired by the American Communist Party was the leadership in the black liberation movements, including the premier scholar of his time, W.E.D. Du Bois, the stellar athlete and performing artist Paul Robeson, and our subject today, lawyer and politician Ben Davis. All made great strides in moving our society towards justice, but the Red Scare reaped a bit of revenge along the way. Let's discuss with the fellow who wrote the book on the subject, Dr. Gerald Horn. Well, warm greetings, everybody. I'm, I'm very excited about this podcast today. We have Professor Gerald Horn, who uh, unfortunately has not been on my radar, but for the past two weeks, I have been just uh, devouring uh, your work. And I'm absolutely ashamed that uh, as one of the most prominent historians of our time, that I wasn't more familiar with your, with your work. And you are uh, uh, received a PhD in Columbia and a law degree from uh, California, Berkeley. And I think you get probably tired of people always complimenting you about how prolific a writer you are, but you are quite pro prolific. Uh, written three dozen books or so, and uh, one every couple of years. So welcome to our podcast. Thank you for inviting me. Good. And although this is not your book, uh, I am. Uh, I just finished this. I just finished this book. I remember, that, and it's absolutely wonderful. Your book on jazz. Good. But but just as another way of uh, introducing you, when you have someone like Cornell West say quotes one of our greatest historian of our times, I think that's the time you just drop the mic and say, "Okay, that's good." So that's that's uh, he, he's he's one of my heroes also. But today we're going to be talking about this book, which is Black Liberation, Red Scare, and it's the story of Ben Davis. And I think I'm correct in looking at your books. You often take people, um, Ben Davis, W. E. Du Bois, uh, Paul Robinson, and in telling the story in jazz and in telling their story, you fill in and guide us in some of our political uh, and American history. And this is rich with that. And um, tell me a little bit about, tell me a little bit about the book. And How sure. And once again, thank you for inviting me. And I take it you're not the Pat Cummings who used to start for the Milwaukee Bucks. No, <laughs> no. But thank God when people Google me, they get that rather than all of my old lawsuits and things like that. So that's good. Okay. Fair enough. So this book was written decades ago. And as, as I recall, I actually, it was written at the instigation of the late Herbert Amplecker, uh, who I knew in New York when I was living there. And uh, I used to spend quite a bit of time at his then office on, I think it was East 30th Street in Manhattan, American Institute of Marxist Studies as it was called, that was his setup. And as I recall, he recommended that I do this project, which I then executed. Now the project, well, first of all, let me tell you about Ben Davis, and then I'll get into the weeds maybe of, that maybe only historians and nerds might be interested in, in terms of how you execute this kind of project when the subject didn't leave, like Langston Hughes did, 800 boxes of papers. Uh, ben Davis maybe left four. Now, Ben Davis was born in Georgia in the early part of the 20th century, uh, passed away in New York circa 1964. He, he was unusual insofar as his father was relatively affluent, which was quite unusual for that time. He was a newspaper publisher 
and also a leader of the then Republican Party. I say then because that was when the Republican Party was still operating under Frederick Douglass's old slogan of the Republican Party being the ship and all else is the sea. That is to say, for those Negroes who could vote, of which there were not many, many of them flocked to the party of Lincoln. And certainly that was true for Ben Davis Sr. But uh, in the late 1920s, the Republican Party, uh, under significant pressure, both externally and internally, uh, began, began an, a purge of the Black leadership, which included uh, Ben Davis Sr., uh, the newspaper publisher. And by that juncture, uh, Ben Davis Jr. Uh, had matriculated at Amherst College in the Pioneer Valley in Massachusetts and Harvard Law School. And so it was a very unique confluence of events that was taking place. By that point, or at least shortly thereafter, he had moved to back to Atlanta and he got caught up in the case of Angelo Herndon, a very prominent civil rights, civil liberties case of that era. Uh, he was a leader of the Young Communist League. And I take it that on this podcast, I don't have to explain what the Communist Party was or the Young no, you, you you would have had to a year ago, but I've been hanging out with Greg, and so I'm, we're we're pretty much uh, up to speed on that. Oh, well, good. And as I recall, because as I said, I wrote this book decades ago. The the charge was something akin to criminal criminal uh, syndicalism, insofar as uh, Angelo Herndon, as was the tendency of the time, was involved in protesting uh, harsh economic conditions. So it was through that case, which was unfolding simultaneously with the case of the Scottsboro Nine in neighboring Alabama. Uh, this was the case of the nine black youth in Scottsboro, Alabama, accused falsely of sexual molestation of two year old American women, uh, were headed like so many others on the fast track to execution when the International Labor Defense intervened. Now, the International Labor Defense was ignited by the US Communist Party, uh, although it's fair to say that its ranks uh, stretched far beyond uh, party membership. And I eventually wrote a, a small book on the Scottsboro Nine. And one of the points that I made in that book and that I've made since and I'll make here is that the Scottsboro Nine case was a real turning point in terms of the struggle against Jim Crow in the United States of America. Because what happened, and this is important in 2021 as well, is that the Communist Party and those within its orbit, it was an international movement. And so therefore, you could internationalize the struggle against Jim Crow you didn't necessarily have to depend upon the good wishes and good graces of those who happened to carry these blue passports. And there were demonstrations all over the world concerning the Scottsboro Nine. There have been numerous books written about the Scottsboro Nine, made for TV movies, documentaries, and, and all the rest, because it was a gigantic step towards the erosion of Jim Crow, which of course begins to take with it, uh, to, uh, begins to assume accelerated speed in the 1950s with the Brown versus Board of Education decision of 1954. So that was the atmosphere into, into which uh, Ben Davis Jr. was plunged in the 1930s. It was through his association with principally the Angelo Herman case, although he did have a kind of tie to the Scottsboro case. Certainly uh, his fellow black attorney communist leader, William Patterson uh, spearheaded the defense of the Scottsboro Nine, but it was through that association that he joined the US Communist Party, moved to New York, 
I take it you want to intervene? Well, uh, Herden was was arrested for just having Marxist material. I mean, it, I've been talking about a nebulous net thrown around him. And as I understand, when Ben Davis did the trial, the, he was so appalled at how the judge responded, how the, the prosecution, that after the trial, he became, <laughs> that's what sparked his interest in in finding out more about the, the party. And that's how he ended up joining. In other words, the party became a, the, the trial became a catalyst for him being involved. Is that, is that correct? Yes. In fact, thank you for refreshing my recollection. And I would also say that this was probably subsequently. Yeah, I'm almost sure subsequently. It's in the book that after Davis Jr. becomes something of a communist veteran, I think it was maybe during the Smith Act trial of 1949. That's the trial in which the communist leadership were jailed, basically. <laughs> that he said that one of the things that attracted him to the Communist Party is that he wanted to hurt Jim Crow. And this seemed like a vehicle through which a movement, which meant that you could draw up on international resources, draw up on the resources of the like-minded uh, all over uh, planet Earth. So in any case, just to resume this thread, uh, that, that causes him uh, to move to New York. He becomes a writer for the Daily Worker, the Communist Party newspaper. Uh, he crosses paths with Richard Wright, the now famed Black novelist and writer by way of Mississippi, Chicago, and then New York. And he and Richard Wright were um, comrades, I guess you could say. And certainly Davis helped to influence Richard Wright. Um, as I recall from the book, he, had, he wasn't altogether pleased with the novel Native Son, which mm -hmm. as you may know, has, has been turned into films. I can think of at least two, <laughs> including one where Richard Wright plays the character Bigger Thomas. If I'm not mistaken, it was filmed in Argentina. And then there's another uh, that Oprah Winfrey uh, helped to produce. In any case, uh, that was the beginning of, of quite an odyssey. Uh, that is to say, Ben Davis in Harlem, New York, uh, where he also becomes close to the Reverend Adam Clayton Powell, Jr., who is a leader in Harlem, a pastor of Abyssinian Baptist Church, which is still in the middle of Harlem uh, as we speak. And Adam Clayton Powell, Jr. Uh, was elected to the New York City Council and then elected to Congress circa 1944, maybe. And Ben Davis Jr. took his seat on the New York City Council, elected uh, one of the not too many, shall we say, communists elected to office in the United States of America, uh, where he specialized in many grassroots struggles, uh, grassroots struggles about eviction, subway fare, desegregation of the Brooklyn Dodgers, uh, integration of public housing or desegregation of public housing. But this is taking place in a very unique political environment. Uh, the unique political environment being the epical events that unfold on June 22nd, 1941, when fascist Germany invades the Soviet Union, uh, Soon thereafter, December 7th, 1941, a militarist Japan attacks the United States, uh, helping to create the lineup for what we call World War II. Uh, that is to say, on the one side, uh, Germany and Japan and Italy. On the other side, the United States, the Soviet Union, United Kingdom, et cetera. And this is a, a very changed political atmosphere. Uh, I've often co times commented, and I'll make the same comment here, <laughs> that it, it's very curious that uh, many of our liberal and conservative uh, fellow denizens of North America 
uh, do not claim that uh, FDR, President Roosevelt, and those around him, not to mention the millions who supported him in the United States, were no more than communist dupes. Because were, not, were they not in an alliance with Moscow? I mean, certainly others who were in an alliance with Moscow, that's the routine chart. Right. Hey, uh, I have to confess, I, I, I was maybe four years old when Stalin died. But to this very day, I have some who will go unnamed who refer to me as a Stalinist, even though I would, as I said, I mean, I might have, must have been the youngest Stalinist ever invented at, at the age of four years old, even. Well, that, that, what, what's interesting about this is that I, these things get blurred. I mean, uh, Greg and I did a, um, we did a podcast with Roger Karen, who was talking about the uh, the effect of the uh, Communist Party in the auto union workers sure. and how they brought us the 40 hour work week and medical care and retirement. And, and then we did a one with Tony uh, Giplin who did the long deep grudge, which was the FE, the farmer's equipment worker. And when you look at what they were, what they were uh, wanting, it's just normal stuff. It's not radical stuff, but it was deemed radical at the at the time and uh, many of the workers when we talked to tony and i guess this fits me too uh as they said i'm not sure if i'm a communist or not but boy i got a lot of good friends that are because they are the most uh prominent people in the movement of, for social justice and change and in fighting white supremacy and the capitalism kind of run amok which occurred after the uh you know, after after the 30s. Is that is that am I correct in that? Do I get a C well, or a sure, B in that? Sure, 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 sure. And as a matter of fact, uh, you opened the door, as the lawyers say, to my adding a footnote, because uh, as I suggested um, early in, in my life writing history, I was concentrating quite a bit uh, on writing this kind of history with regard to histories of communism. But if you look at what I've been writing lately, well, other than the book I did on boxing, I did a book last year on the 16th century. And in that book, I put forward uh, a, a kind of analysis beginning in the 16th century, post-1492, the long 16th century, from 1492 in Columbus to 1607, when the English settlers arrived in what they call Virginia. And the, the analysis that I put forward is that you had a, a kind of transition from religious sectarianism uh, sponsored by Inquis inquisitorial Spain, which then is challenged by Protestant England, the scrappy underdog whose language we're now speaking, as you might've noticed. And the scrappy underdog uh, pressed to the wall at least a transition from religion to quote race, unquote, which helps to account for why so many people who look like me uh, appear on these shores. Now, before <laughs> one of your audience says, well, didn't the Spanish en en enslave? Of course, they enslaved. But uh, those familiar with the history of Cuba probably know that in Spanish Cuba in the 1500s, uh, you could be an African conquistador if you profess Catholicism. Whereas uh, under London's misrule, I mean, you, know, you could be a Negro and name your child Martin Luther. <laughs> You'd still be a slave. Right, right. <laughs> and so then the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804, uh, have upsets the apple cart with regard to slavery, a world historic event. I talk about it in my book, Confronting Black Jacobins on the Haitian Revolution. And needless to say, it leads to a general crisis in the entire slave system that can only be resolved with this collapse, including in the United States by 1865, which gives uh, impetus to, to the class project, the working class project, the struggle for the eight hour day, the struggle for unions, which then reads as a kind of apogee in 1917 with the Russian Revolution, uh, which then helps to give rise to communist parties that then help to organize international labor defense and the uh, CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, uh, a 
version of which is still with us today. And that's the background leading to Ben Davis Jr. Uh, joining the US Communist Party and his other comrades who were trying to remove the barnacles of the past, particularly the barnacle of racism and white supremacy, and then implant in the belly of the beast the seeds for the future. Uh, that is to say, a socialist project with an empowered working class uh, being the objective. So that's the context for him being elected to the New York City Council. 1943, as I recall, was the first election in which he triumphed, uh, then reelected in 1945, and then unceremoniously and perhaps improperly ousted by 1949. Uh, with that following, of course, in the wake of the conclusion of World War II, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, August 1945. It seems like you have something to interject, or am I mistaken? No, no, you're 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 fine. I think you're you're um, you're leading up to the Smith the Smith Act. Our 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 COVID um, um, moral panic that uh, was <laughs> sweeping sweeping the nation at that time and. Um, that's an integral part about all this. I mean, he he had power through his writing. He had power through the black press. He had power through his, his skills of oration. You wrote in your book, he would sometimes do 30 speeches, 30 speeches a day. And even though the, the Communist Party membership wasn't that big, he had huge crowds. And everything that he was professing was of great need to the people <laughs> The people there, you know, they, they the rent control and dealing with landlords and safety issues and schooling and education, um, normal stuff. And 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 you keep saying normal. <laughs> it's, there's nothing in the platforms. There's nothing that nothing that, that nothing that was written about in your book that was really that radical. I mean, it was all trying to push back against Jim Crow, trying to make reasonable changes to better the lives of, of most of the black people in the South and in the North too. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And ultimately, and ultimately of course, uh, working class people as a whole, as you well know. And part of what I sketched in this book is something I expanded upon in subsequent books, uh, which is that because of the rancid Jim Crow that was visited upon uh, Black Americans, in some ways, the US ruling class had handed the Black community to the Communist Party on a silver platter, um, which <laughs> something that Ben Davis uh, profited from. And uh, I think it's also fair to say that even though there was anti-communism within the Black community, uh, it was not as developed as it was in other sectors of the U.S. body politic, uh, not least because <clears throat> some of the tallest trees in our forest, not only Ben Davis, but his comrade Paul Robeson. Paul Robeson used to say that in order to get the dramatic persona to effectively portray Othello, Shakespeare's play, uh, he would imagine his friend and comrade, Ben Davis, betraying him. Mm -hmm. and that would help to psych him up as an actor <laughs> to perform on stage and give a convincing performance. And then, of course, I mentioned William Patterson, Claudia Jones. W.E. Du Bois. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, Shirley Graham Du Bois, who I wrote a biography of, of et cetera. So in any case, uh, back to the chronological thread, uh, so in 1949 is the Smith Act case, which is a very interesting trial. And, and, and by the way, and this is when I just start dropping uh, nuggets for uh, future scholars, future researchers, the transcript of the Smith Act case, which runs into thousands of pages, 
is, is in New York at the Schomburg Library. I can't rec recall the collection, but it shouldn't be that hard to find. And somebody needs to do a book on the entire Smith Act case uh, because it's full of dramatic testimony, uh, full of uh, personalities. For example, uh, Ben Davis Jr.'s, his lawyer for the Smith Act trial was George Crockett, who winds up becoming a member of Congress, a member of the leader of the Congressional Black Caucus by the 1980s, if I'm not mistaken, from Detroit. Um, he, uh, He's part of one of the first so-called racially integrated law firms in Detroit, Michigan, which is still with us. A, a, a simple search in a search engine will re reproduce the name of the firm. But in any case, George Crockett's defense of Ben Davis was so militant that not only did the conviction of Davis lead to his being in prison for about four years, but Crockett was jailed. <laughs> right, right. They jailed the defenders and then jailed the lawyers. I mean, it was, <laughs> and then of course, uh, I should say it was part of a wipeout. Somebody should, matter of fact, you, you could, all the transcripts are available. If somebody wants to write a big book, they could do a, get all the transcripts of all the Smith Act trials. Because, well, I, d I didn't realize it until I was Googling around with Smith Act trying to get more information. There was the Seattle Seven, exact same, exact same timelines, seven people, none of them really connected. Uh, a, a man that was a union organizer, a different people, all of these just nebulous, vague um, threats that saying that they were threatening our, you know, our government. Long sentences, complete, it was you know the Salem witch trials that you know we know about the crucible and all of that but it, it, um, amazing just amazing and I was telling Greg before you got on uh, uh, something about a, a somebody two years ago went in their parents basement and found a communist card with their manifesto and it was signed by the guy that was in the Smith Act that the, that he hid from his family because he was so fearful that even to just be affiliated at all could be a, a horrible thing for your life, you know, based on how this was so, I don't know. I, why didn't I know about this is, is kind of part of my shame about this. Well, um, you know, it's interesting. So fortunately, uh, C-SPAN, the television channel, mm -hmm. they were induced to spend three hours with me a few years ago on my work and in the context of the discussion, the host asked me, are you a member of the Communist Party? And I was expecting that question. So I had a canned answer, which was, we're not allowed to say. <laughs> <laughs> you can look it up. On there you go. Party. There you go. That's good. But in any case, with regard to the Seattle Seven, uh, I have a book coming out in a few weeks on that deals with that case because I did, you're in Seattle, I take it. I'm in Seattle, right. Yeah, I did research at the University of Washington on, on that case because uh, um, the book is on the Civil Rights Congress. The hardback came out in 1987. The paperback is coming out in 2021, 2022. So. You can figure that out. But in any case, as I was saying, you know, there was a, a huge Smith Act trial in Hawaii, huge Smith Act trials in Los Angeles. I mean, it was, a, it was really, they just locked up <laughs> and harassed and persecuted the Communist Party leadership. And I've argued that arguably the US left has yet to recover, even right. though that was 70 plus years ago, because simultaneously, there was a purging of Hollywood. Uh, you had Harry Bridges of the West Coast Long Shore. Uh, they can, were, had workers unionized from Seattle to San Diego, then out into the Pacific and Hawaii. There was an attempt to deport him. He was well-born in Melbourne, Australia and organized the general strike in San Francisco in 1934. And the CIO uh, tried to oust 
his union from the House of Labor, and the United States authorities tried to deport him. And so, but, but what's interesting about that period, and what I talk about in this book and other books, is that it's, it's, it's a mixed period. Because at the same time, you have this cruel crackdown on the Communist Party. You have these anti-Jim Crow concessions, uh, as evidenced by Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, the US High Court decision that says Jim Crow is unconstitutional. And so to a certain extent, the US ruling class is trying to ride two different horses going in different directions at the same time. Uh, they're pushing the left beyond the pale, uh, the organized left, particularly the Communist Party and those within its orbit. And at the same time, there are these anti-Jim Crow concessions, which then erodes the possibility that this communist constituency that Davis had capitalized on, speaking of Black Americans, would be still susceptible to the blandishments of the communists. So it was a very interesting maneuver that took place. The problem, of course, is that most of the Blacks were working class background. And so they, as the saying goes, they won the right to check into the hotel, but because their wages were circumscribed by the simultaneous attack on left-led unions, they didn't have the money to pay the bill. And arguably, we're still in that particular crux, that particular crux of a cruel dilemma, uh, having certain rights, but not the money to fulfill those rights. It's, I guess, the essence of what some sterner critics would call bourgeois democracy, for example. So in any case, uh, Davis spends four years on ice in federal prison in Terre Haute, Indiana. Treated poorly. Oh, of course, and, and, as because you know we're, we're talking about Jim Crow in the United States. There are segregated prisons. Uh, his, his fellow defendant, uh, Henry Winston, who becomes leader of the U.S. Communist Party, subsequently goes blind uh, in prison and then emerges with the slogan, they took my sight but not my vision as the saying went. And then by the time he emerges, there's a new situation. The new situation being the death of Stalin in 1953, the launching of the Montgomery bus boycott late 1955, 1956, the Khrushchev revelations about Stalin at the 20th Soviet Communist Party Congress, the anti-party revolt in Budapest, Hungary, and of course, something that we're still living in the shadows of to this very day, which is the joint Israeli-British-French attack on Nasser's Egypt over the Suez Canal, a true turning point in international relations insofar as it's a, a further process in driving Israel to the right arguably that process has not ceased to this very day. London sees the jig is up with regard to its deteriorating empire. Right. And as evidenced by Boris Johnson playing a sycophant to Biden within the last 24 to 48 hours, it tries to tie itself to the apron strings of Uncle Sam and the so-called special relationship, which is seems to be special only to the London ruling class, not too special to the US. And then France takes a different position. It decides it has to be much more independent. And uh, I, I dare say, and perhaps I'll be proven mistaken, which won't be the first time I'm afraid to say, that this French recalling of their ambassadors to the United States in light of the US big footing France over the submarine deal to Australia uh, might be another one of those uh, hinge moments in terms of international relations, uh, complicating the new Cold War, Cold War II with China, uh, which may be difficult to execute without France and the French influenced European Union being on board. And once again, uh, I would be remiss if I did not throw a pebble or two at the direction 
of the mainstream press, particularly in the New York Times, which keeps reassuring us readers that you know, France is ineffectual. They can't do anything. They're going to have to, to swallow their pride and accept this. I, I, I don't know. We'll see. Right. I'm not so sure about that. But in any case, so all of those events are swirling and unfolding, and this helps to contribute to a party crisis uh, in the mid to late 1950s, which was not a propitious moment given the eruption of anti-Jim Crow protests uh, coming from Montgomery, Alabama with Martin Luther King Jr., who, by the way, his family uh, was close to the family of Ben Davis Jr. and, and part of the um, surveillance <laughs> of Martin Luther King. Uh, part of it stems from this uh, shocking episode in Harlem circa 1958 when Martin Luther King is stabbed, apparently, allegedly, purportedly, by this crazed individual. Uh, he comes literally within a breath of losing his life then. Uh, ben Davis Jr. gives him a blood transfusion, which then leads to this- Which makes him a communist now. He has communist blood flowing in his veins, quite literally. <laughs> right. Please. Right. But that, that his affiliation ended up putting Martin Luther King on the crosshairs, right? Wasn't that- of course. Uh, and then yeah. King would not distance himself from a man uh, I, I came to know very well, the man we know as Jack O'Dell, who was a close aide to King, a close aide to uh, Jesse Jackson when he was running his campaigns. Are you seeking? Oh, I thought you were seeking to intervene. No. Um, and of course, a former member of the National Maritime Union, a former sailor, former chairman of the board of Pacifica Radio, which I continue to have an affiliation with. And you might recall that it was JFK, John Kennedy, who took King into the Rose Garden of the White House to escape the prying of FBI director J. Edgar Hoover, the bulldog-like repressor in chief, and instructed, JFK instructs King to put some distance between himself and Jack. King says, sure. But then he doesn't do so, which then accelerates the surveillance, uh, contributing to this idea that Hoover floats that King is the most notorious liar in the United States. In any case, uh, you know, this is happening against the background, backdrop of these internal Communist Party struggles. And uh, Davis is considered to be part of the hardliners, as they were called. Uh, interestingly enough, as I think I point out in this book, if I didn't, I pointed it out in another book, maybe my Patterson book, that um, I think most of the black comrades, they didn't have, they didn't have as many options, e even, even though you know, Davis was a Harvard trained lawyer, but <laughs> he was a Harvard trained lawyer in a Jim Crow society. And you know, it's just like the saying, uh, what do you call a, a black man with a Harvard law degree we call them N-I-G-G-E-R, for example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they were... Well, it, it, on that light, changing the subject, but not changing it. When I first met Greg, I remember we were sitting around in his sister's garage chatting, and he had made a comment that it was the Communist Party was the only or one of the few are the only organization in the country at some point in time that had equanimity uh, with, with black and whites coming in on equal standing. And as I'm, I'm looking at this communist card from 1945, the Seattle seven, and there's a few duties and responsibilities, a fight for full social, political and economic equality of the Negro people for the Negro and the white unity a fight against all forms of national oppression, discrimination and segregation and ideological influences and practices of racial theories. I mean, integrated into their basic belief system is this, I, you know, we're equal, we, we are together. And to what extent do you think that that acceptance of blacks and whites together, and you mentioned that a little bit in your in your jazz book too, when you're all of a sudden having jazz being a, um, 
a magnet to bring black people, white people together. It created, uh, I think that seemed to fuel some of the hysteria too. I don't know. What do you, what do you? Well, of course, of course, because the United States, it was, and to a certain degree still is a Jim Crow society. Right. And this ties into my previous point, which is that part of the historic mission of the Communist Party and the class project advocates was to sweep away the detritus of the past, the barnacles of the past, not least being the race project, not least being the legacy of slavery, the toxic legacy of slavery, not least being the toxic legacy of Jim Crow. And this was not just a US domestic movement. I wrote a book called White Supremacy Confronted. It's the longest book I've ever written. It's about 900 pages dealing with South Africa, Southern Africa. And of course, uh, part of the story I tell is about the Communist Party of South Africa, which once had as leading members, not only Nelson Mandela, but Thabo Mbeki, his successor. I won't mention Jacob Zuma. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned Dick Cheney. <laughs> <laughs> that um, was his big thing was that they're all communists. They're all, com- you know, that was right, his. Right, that was, right. yeah. And so this was part of their historic mission. Uh, you know, the, 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 at least in the Black Liberation Movement, uh, people like to quote this phrase from Frantz Fanon, the Martinican born psychiatrist who associates himself with the Algerian revolution in the 1950s, in the 1960s, writes Wretched of the Earth, uh, Black Skin, White Mass, many books. He has this phrase about uh, something like the task of a generation is to discover its mission and then either to fulfill it or to fail in doing so. And I think that part of the mission of the communist left was to do its damnedest, as that membership card you recited just suggested, to do its damnedest to rip out root and branch the race project, for example, which then sets the stage for the flourishing of the class project. And uh, of course, the competition from the two major parties Speaking of the Democratic Party, which for the longest was the party of Jim Crow with an armed wing called the Ku Klux Klan. Mm -hmm. This is all before the Voting Rights Act of 1965, of course. And then the Republican Party, which, as I said, you know, their turning point comes in the 1920s when they begin to purge people like Ben Davis Sr. So uh, to that extent, uh, one could say that the organized left and the communist left uh, were successful, uh, whatever mistakes and blunders that they might have made being put aside. But back to Ben Davis, uh, with the rising of the anti-Jim Crow movement as symbolized by Dr. King, uh, you have a kind of thawing of the political repression, particularly on campuses, which is one reason <laughs> today, where there's so much focus and emphasis on campus campuses, uh, as we speak, I'm afraid to say. And Ben Davis and other communist leaders began speaking on campuses, uh, attracting mass audiences. Uh, this helps to revive to a degree, the Communist Party's fortunes, including their youth wing, uh, which takes on the name in the 1960s, W.E.B. Du Bois clubs. And what happens, of course, is that to come to a fork in the road, uh, Ben Davis Jr. unfortunately passes away in 1964. I think he was about the age of 60 which many of us today, including myself, would consider to be a premature in, in terms of a passing from the scene. So in our remaining time, I'll turn it over to you. And if you want to pepper me with questions or enter into a kind of exposition on your own, feel free. 
Well, I just, I, I'll, I want Greg to talk, but I'm thinking I, I went to a school in central Illinois in a small liberal arts college, and we had the head of the Nazi party speak. We had the next month, William F. Kunstler speak about the Chicago Seven. We had, we had a wide, wide variety of different people coming in, and, uh, and I'm thinking of how that's going to I don't know if that would play very well at Smith College right now. So anyway, that's my mm. thought. It's an unfortunate change of how we've closed our mind of what we think of liberalism as far as acceptance and pluralism and different thoughts. So, Well, you know, it's interesting. I'm sure you're familiar with the debates unfolding about so-called critical race theory, which many people had never heard of until a few months ago. And now it's all the rage. I mean, laws are being passed in states to fine, if not fire teachers who are teaching CRT. Right. Although most of the legislators, they wouldn't recognize CRT if it came up and smacked them in the face. Right. right. It's really sort of evocative of the Red Scare, uh, in a sense. Uh, that is to say that just like uh, under a certain logic, you could include, you could say the entire United States were Soviet dupes insofar as they were allied with Stalin's Moscow from 1941 to 1945, uh, you have a similar sort of logic working with regard to CRT, which as I said, most of these people can't define. Yeah, it's like the 1619 project. Uh, you know, I had a few problems with it. It's fine though, it's a different way of looking at things, but oh my God, it creates this huge backlash with Trump having the, what was the 1776 project? And, yeah. Oh, oh goodness let, let gracious. Me, let me make another footnote. Uh, in The Nation, the New York-based progressive weekly, I have a big piece coming out in a few days, in fact, that deals with slavery in the 1619 Project. So tell your listeners to stay tuned. Good. Okay. Great. Great. Yeah. Greg, what are some of your thoughts? Yeah, I... I uh... I'm kind of struck by the fact that there's a lot of young scholars now who are picking up on the on the role of black communists. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's my imagination, but it seems to me I'm seeing a lot more articles, a lot more interventions by younger scholars who are saying, hey, there's a story with Claudia Jones. There's a story with Ben Davis. I, I'd like to believe a lot of that's because of your work. I mean, your work going back uh, a long time. But do you see that? Do you see that there is a, a kind of a reconsideration of the role of uh, black communist um, in, in academia? Well, in to general? a degree, to a degree. I mean, certainly with regard to Claudia Jones, I mean, she's becoming sort of a cult figure. Uh, as a matter of fact, in that piece, aforementioned piece in the nation, uh, I refer to her and I think the term I used is the foremother of intersectionality. Yeah. <laughs> for example, that is to say, you're appropriating that term, <laughs> right? Okay, <laughs> I have to you mark know, you. I'll mark you down on that one. So oh, I see. Well, it was, it's just in passing, for what it's worth, and and so uh, and it's and it's 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 understandable given her preeminent role in the United States and Trinidad and Tobago and in London, uh, where after she's deported after a Smith Act trial, of course, uh, in the 1950s, she's deported. And winds up in London, where she becomes a leader of the emerging Black community in London and helps to uh, publish a newspaper. I think it's called the West Indian Gazette, if not, if not mistaken, which is still a primary source for Black British history uh, from that period. So th there, there is something to what you say. I, I'd like to see more, uh, to be frank with you, but maybe I'm greedy. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I, you know, Greg turned me on to this book a couple of weeks ago and I read it, The Economic Interpretation of the Constitution, Charles A. Beard. Oh, yeah. I'm sure you know about this, but, oh, yeah. uh, you know, when you're when you're looking at the the slavery in our country, they would say one thing, but ultimately they always acted within their interests, especially in when slavery was centered around in in um, Virginia. I. I um, I, I found one article a while back, I'd be interested if you could help me with this. It was looking at the 
economic uh, cost, uh, or the, the value of the average person and their uh, GDP in the South and in the North. And it said that in Alabama and Mississippi during the height of slavery, if they had almost twice the standard of living that they did up in Boston and in other areas because the power of the economic, uh, the value of slave and the ability to um, capture GDP was just remarkable. And I always thought of the South as being, well, you had the plantation owners and then everybody else was, was horribly poor, but that wasn't the case. There was a lot of value that they reaped. And I can't find that article again. I don't know, if, am I off on that? Oh, no, not at all. Um, point number one is that as of 1860, the most valuable investment in the United States, of course, was the investment in slave Africans. And, and in fact, um, I think I made the, this point in the article I wrote for the nation in February, that in terms of trying to unpack the rather historical anti-communism that exists in the United States, folks may want to look at the fact that the slave owning class was expropriated without compensation. Unlike in the British empire, where up until maybe 2015, the descendants of slave owners were still being paid off from the 1830s uh, hmm. abolition. And when I teach this in my classes, often, you know, you know, these students nowadays, you're, you're teaching in a seminar room and there's fiddling with their smartphones, of course, you know, I don't know, maybe looking at a TikTok video as you're trying to educate them. So I usually grab their smartphone and say, I'm expropriating your property without compensation. <laughs> <laughs> you're not very happy with that art. You pr probably want to take me outside and give me a sound thrashing. Well, that's basically what happened in the United States. And then of course, socialism, uh, the, the perception at least, is that it involves expropriation of private property without compensation. So no wonder the United States becomes sort of the epicenter of uh, anti-communism. And the other tip I would make is that with regard to New Orleans, I, I would recommend, and you, you could say that I, that I suggested that you uh, make the contact, that you interview uh, Walter Johnson of Harvard, who, is very progressive, Un, you know, unlike, I'm afraid to say, many of his colleagues there. His book on St. Louis in particular, The Broken Heart of America. But before that, he did a book on um, slavery, slavery in New Orleans, in fact. And I think now he's doing a book, he's stuck in the Midwest, he's doing a book on Cairo, Illinois. But uh, very insightful, very progressive, uh, at least in my estimation. Yeah, I, I was uh, reading a little bit about your observations about slavery in Brazil and how we oh, yeah. supported, supported that. Tell, tell me a little bit about that. I have a friend who's, uh, dating a girl in Brazil right now. Is that right? Uh, yeah. tell, tell him my book on Brazil has been translated into Portuguese. As a matter of fact, it's sold better in, in Brazil than it has in the United States. No comparison. Every time I get in the car, he's got the Portuguese uh, uh, tape on, trying to learn Portuguese to speak better yeah. to his friend. Tell him to read my book in Portuguese. Okay. Yeah. And uh, in English, is the deepest South, United States, Brazil, and the African slave trade. And one of the reasons why Brazil has one of the largest populations of African descent on this side of Nigeria is because of the manic energy of these US slave traders in the 1840s who descended upon Angola and Mozambique with the maniacal energy of crazed bees manacling and handcuffing every African in sight and dragging them to Brazil. Mm -hmm. And I end the book with a vignette from the, well, George W. Bush, I can't remember, it was 43rd US president. And Condoleezza Rice, as he's about to meet with a Brazilian leader, uh, she instructs him, because he didn't know that Brazil has such a large black population. This is the leader of the so-called free world, not being aware of the basic demographics of the other power in the hemisphere, shockingly enough. 
And of course, uh, Condoleezza could have gone on to say is, is that the reason they have such a large black population is because of the country you're now ruling, Mr. President. But um, see, see, I, I think, and I say this in the nation piece, I mean, that there, even by some of our friends on the left, there has been an underestimation of the role of slavery. It's almost as it's like it was a big accident, you know, and that when you had 1776, they just forgot to include the Negroes and others in their bounty, uh, which of course is ludicrous. It's the looniest idea since Looney Tunes, but that is a common misconception which helps to explain why we're in such deep water nowadays in this country with the new Woodward Foster book, <laughs> Peril, in his first few pages, not only talking about the possibility of a coup d'etat by Mr. Trump in January 2021, but a military strike on the People's Republic of China so he could declare a national emergency to remain in office with both catastrophes barely averted in an organization of which I'm a part, and I will mention their name. I recall we had a debate in January, 2021 and wound up issuing a statement uh, downplaying the profundity of the events saying, you know, it's just a bunch of ruffians and riffraff and, you know, please. And I, you know, I ha let the record show that I objected strenuously, but was voted down. Yeah, four days ago, more more on that of how active he was and of his firing think, attorney generals and. I think your insight on uh, this break with France is uh, is very important. Uh, I think uh, we can't underestimate what it means um, to really throw the French under the bus like this in this anti-China action. Uh, what do you see uh, happening with this turn to uh, to the east? This it started in the Obama administration. Well, it's going to be very interesting. I mean, you know, as, as Yogi Berra once said, it's difficult to make predictions, particularly about the future. <laughs> but having said that, things don't look very good right now for U.S. imperialists. I, okay, I know I've said it before, <laughs> but really, they really don't look very good right now because if the European Union doesn't sign on to this new Cold War, and given the fact that Japan seemingly is about to have an even more right-wing prime minister, which is going to complicate relations with South Korea, which makes the whole encirclement project more problematic, and given the fact that we just had the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit, of course, which is led by China and Russia, with uh, Iran now being co-opted to its ranks, so at the same time, the NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization led by the United States might be fractured. Uh, France withdrew from the military wing of NATO in 2009 before, excuse me, um, under Charles de Gaulle before uh, re-entering in 2009 and might withdraw again. Uh, there was supposed to be in Pittsburgh a meeting. You're not in Pittsburgh, are you? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, maybe you know something about this. According to the Financial Times of London this morning, September 22nd, 2021, there was supposed to be a big meeting in Pittsburgh this week of the mm -hmm. Trade and Technology Council, which is an EU-US setup, which was part of the whole China encirclement plan. But it's been canceled or postponed mm -hmm. because of French upset. So as I said, things don't look very good for US imperialism right now, but you know, well, in, in, the I've said that vein, in the same vein, uh, uh, I circulated an article from the Wall Street Journal yesterday among comrades, uh, which uh, was an assessment of uh, Xi in China and the direction mm -hmm. they're going in, which is pretty remarkable. Common prosperity. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. In terms of that development, in terms of this, uh, this uh, large uh, property owner, which the uh, Chinese government has decided they're not going to prop up, all mm -hmm. the Western investors who poured billions of dollars. There's something like $305 billion at stake here in terms of debt. Um, the Chinese government says, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna bail them out. And the West, all the Western investors were counting on the Chinese government doing what we do, and that is bailing out this capitalist enterprise. 
So what's your assessment of where China is going right now? I, I don't, I never, I never deal with the question, is it socialist, is it capitalist? My question is, where is it going? And how do you, where do you see it going? Well, when you mention Evergrande, the, the, or yes. Evergrande, the, the sperm in China that may be going belly up, I immediately flash to the fact that George Soros, the US space billionaire, who was oftentimes demonized by Fox News, has been writing these fire-breathing editorials on the Wall Street Journal editorial page against China of late. Mm -hmm. In fact, calling out other comrades in the US ruling class, such as Lawrence Fink of BlackRock, which probably handles more investments in the trillions than any other firm, for not following in his footsteps. And interestingly enough, he's on the same page as another figure we should keep cl a close watch on, Peter Thiel, T-H-I-E-L. Oh, I know him, yeah. Yes. Hedge fund okay. guy, the Eric, Eric Weinstein's uh, boss. Right, and of course, uh, spoke at the Republican convention in 2016, one of Trump's comrades. Interestingly enough, like Elon Musk, he spent a good deal of his childhood, not only in South Africa, apartheid South Africa, but he went must went better. He also spent part-time his childhood in Namibia, which had been colonized by the precursors of fascist Germany before being taken over by apartheid South Africa. So, okay, to get to your point, um, China is under tremendous pressure right now, but at the same time, it has the North Atlantic powers under tremendous pressure. In fact, I attribute this bungling by Mr. Biden with regard to big footing France to the pressure that the US administration is under. Uh, that is to say, after the ham-fisted evacuation from Afghanistan, that Mr. Biden wanted to appear to be uh, back on his game. And then he calls this premature virtual press conference with Scott Morrison, that fellow from down under, as he called him, yeah. of Australia, and, uh, and Boris Johnson, Mr. Sycophant. Of At least Trump. he didn't call him chief or, or you know, whatever. <laughs> My man. Yeah, yeah. My man or something. <laughs> I mean, he kind of, kind of was connecting there a little. Yeah. All right, but but I, I'll wrap this up because I know we're running out of time. So I, I would like to think, and I've been wrong before. That's why I'm so hesitant. I would like to think that with common prosperity, and the fact that in that context, uh, there's been steps to redistribute the wealth from top to bottom in China. Corporations are being enticed, if not coerced, to fork over billions to the coffers. Uh, proposals for improving the social welfare system. I would like to think that China is on the right track, but as I said, you know, I'm not confident when I speak on this issue, but in any case, thank you very much for inviting thank you. me. Thank you. This has been an absolute treat for me, and mm. I can't tell you mm. how much I've enjoyed getting to know you and uh, you are my new Chomsky that I'll be oh, tracking and tracking and following. Go ahead, and give it a Chomsky and, and stick with uh, Professor Horn. Right. <laughs> Thank yeah. you.